Hi, it's Richard Dwyer. It is June the 10th, 2020. RichardDwyer.com, my law firm site. Keepingitfree.blogspot.com, my free financial blog. When I was younger, an immigrant from Jamaica, my immigrant father was riveted in the early 1970s by the Watergate story. We were both trying to figure out American government. And the Watergate story was unfolding. It didn't seem that important at the time. But then it unfolded into something big, something huge, to the point where the president's resignation was a foregone conclusion. You knew it was going to happen. Now, I remember my father telling me, and I was just a very young boy at the time, about Watergate, and I was confused. I didn't quite understand it. And he would tell me, you know, when you, go, when you grow older, you'll understand that this is important. He would repeat that to me. When you grow older, you'll understand this. This is important. So, now I'm older, and because of the pandemic and a lot of canceled work appointments, I've actually had some time to watch shows like Slow Burn, to do my own investigative research into exactly what happened during the Watergate scandal. And let me just say, it's simply breathtaking. So what I'm gonna do here for my crime channel is to talk about a level of corruption that's hard for us today in 2020 to understand. It's simply breathtaking. Watergate happened more than 45 years ago, but it's still the kind of thing that shakes up the imagination. It really does shake your faith in government, right? I tell my four-year-old, question authority. One day she's going to grow up and she's going to understand what Watergate represents. Let's try to summarize it here. In the simplest of terms, Watergate involves the wiretapping of the Democratic Party headquarters located in the Watergate Hotel. Now, what's simply astonishing is that the committee for the re-election of the president, which was headed by Attorney General John Mitchell, approved of this illegal burglary. They approved of men breaking into the Democratic Party headquarters to install wiretapping material on the phones. So understand, John Mitchell, the Attorney General, literally authorized the break-in. The level of corruption is so shocking that understand how the break-in was financed. It was financed with money that was actually donated to the committee to reelect the president. These donors thought they were making a private contribution to the president's campaign. They were asked to make the private donations by certified and cashier's checks. Those checks were actually then deposited into different accounts owned by one of the Watergate burglars, right? Bernard Barker, who had Mexican bank accounts, had American bank accounts. He had corporate accounts as well. Let's get an idea on the money. 
1972 dollars, the donations totaled $86,000. Today, that would equal $526,000. Right? Understand, too, that the committee for the re-election of the president actively engaged in this kind of money laundering. So they peeled off $25,000, which would be approximately $153,000 in today's money to fund the burglary, the break-in of Watergate to install wiretaps on Democratic phones and to get documents. So, at the time of the break-in, the night of June the 17th, 1972, the man who approved of the break-in, Attorney General John Mitchell, is with his wife, Martha Mitchell, at a fundraiser in Ritzy Palace Verdes, California. So, of course, at the party, West Coast time, news of the break-in is broadcast on TV. John Mitchell sees the news. John Mitchell then hears that James McCord, someone who worked for the committee for the re-election of the president, was one of the burglars, right? That's what breaks this open. Now keep in mind, Mitchell, while at the party, knows he's authorized to break in. But the break-in was supposed to be done with people who couldn't be tied back to the committee for the re-election of the president. Well, unfortunately, one of the people who planned the break-in, G. Gordon Liddy, who happened to be finance counsel for the committee for the re-election of the president, was foolish enough to include James McCord. who had a formal position with the Committee for the Re-Election of the President. So at the party, according to the owner of the house, which overlooked the Pacific Ocean, right? Pacific Palisades is in Southern California. At the party, she found Attorney General John Mitchell dangerously close to the edge of the cliff in back of the house. So she actually starts talking with Mitchell, who seems a little bit distant. And she says to him, hey, that's dangerous. Words to that effect. Hey, that's dangerous. You need to come back inside with me. And Mitchell apparently looks at the water and then turns around in resignation and comes back into the house. Right? The owner of the house thought that Mitchell seemed preoccupied with something. I believe that Mitchell understood the night of Watergate, that the president's re-election was in trouble, that this could be traced back to him, the Attorney General, to the President's Re-Election Committee. That the Re-Election Committee was actually an outlaw outfit that was using donations to the President's campaign that was laundering the money through Bernard Barker's accounts, both here and in Mexico. Well, the next day, Mitchell takes his wife, Martha Mitchell, very important person, 
to Newport Beach, California. Full disclosure, I used to live for a few years in Newport Beach, California. They go to a hotel. Mitchell leaves her there with bodyguards. Right, he goes back east, presumably to Washington, D.C. Right, to deal with this break-in. It's at the hotel in Newport Beach, California, that Martha Mitchell then finds out from the TV, which she was not supposed to be watching, that her daughter's former driver and bodyguard, James McCord, who worked for her husband's Committee for Re-Election of the President, was one of the burglars. She immediately figured out that this burglary was done by her husband's committee, that her husband's career was in jeopardy. So she picks up the phone and she calls reporter Helen Thomas, right? The famous Helen Thomas, who used to be in the front row of White House briefings. So she's on the phone with Helen Thomas, and she tells Helen Thomas that she had told her husband that she was going to leave him if he did not step down from the committee for re-election of the president. Right, suddenly the phone goes dead. According to Martha Mitchell, right, according to Martha Mitchell, multiple men grab her, take the phone away from her by force, and then inject her with some kind of anesthesia. So let me say, days later, a New York Daily News reporter, Marsha Kramer, sees Martha Mitchell on the East Coast in Rye, New York, at the Westchester Country Club. Right? Folks, she has vis visible bruises on her. Marsha Kramer described her as a beaten woman. Beaten. Martha Mitchell would continue to call reporters, would continue to talk about how her husband needed to get off the committee for re-election of the president. Continued to drop hints that this burglary, which the public thought was minor, was major and that her husband needed to leave the committee. Understand, in psychiatry now, we actually have something called the Martha Mitchell Syndrome. It's where the patient appears to be deluded, saying fanciful things, but is actually telling the truth. Well, then we get to the day after the Watergate break-in, right? White House counsel John Dean is in downtown D.C. and he sees G. Gordon Liddy, right? Liddy comes over to him. Liddy admits that he blew it by involving James McCord in the burglary, right? Understand, Dean knew of the burglary. These men are openly discussing it on a street corner. They actually stop by a bench on the sidewalk, right? They're openly talking. And G. Gordon Liddy tells White House counsel John Dean that he understands that he may have cost the president re-election, right? He goes further. He actually says, look, if you want to take me out, I only ask that you not do it in front of my family. 
He says, I can tell you where I'm going to be on a street corner, and you can take me out there. Right? It's clear from the conversation, and understand the source is John Dean. This is on the EPIC series, Slow Burn. It's clear from the conversation that G. Gordon Liddy felt that the president might actually want to have him killed. It's also clear that the day after the break-in, Liddy, again, who was finance counsel for the committee for re-election of the president, right? It's clear that Liddy and Dean understood the severity, the importance of the Watergate break-in. Well, let's go further. So, of course, the FBI figures out that Two of the burglars have Howard Hunt's name in their address books, right? Howard Hunt was a former CIA operative who, believe it or not, had a safe at the White House. He was an associate of Richard Nixon's, right? Associate slash advisor, right? So, of course, top Nixon aide, John Ehrlichman, tells White House counsel, John Dean, that he needs to, in Dean's words, deep six, deep six, the contents of Howard Hunt's White House safe. So understand, not only does John Dean do so, But the acting director of the FBI, L. Patrick Gray, also destroyed evidence from Hunt's safe. In other words, folks, the cover-up is immediate. The importance of the burglary is obvious to the attorney general who authorized it, John Mitchell, G. Gordon Liddy, who thought that the president might want to take him out. Right? His words, take him out because of what happened. And to John Dean, who's engaging in activity, like getting inside Howard Hunt's White House safe and destroying evidence from the safe. So, of course, the five guys busted doing the burglary, as well as G. Gordon Liddy and Howard Hunt, who got the five guys to do the burglary, all go on trial. Right now, here's where it gets really bizarre. Before he is sentenced, right, before, you know, the guys fully learned their fate. E. Howard Hunt, who organized the break-in with Liddy, had his lawyer contact the White House and demand, again, this is early 1970s money, $120,000 from the White House. Again, $120,000 from the White House. Now, what I'm going to do, because there was some excellent reporting done that broke this wide open, I'm going to read from a May 1st, 1974 article from the Washington Post, written by Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, entitled, Nixon Debated Paying Blackmail, comma, Clemency. Right, I'm just going to read the first few paragraphs. You'll understand the level of corruption and how high it went. President Nixon, during a lengthy meeting in the Oval Office on March 21, 1973, told White House Counsel John W. Dean III that, here's the quote, you have no choice but to come up with the $120,000. End of the quote. 
demanded his blackmail payment by one of the Watergate burglars, according to an edited transcript of the meeting. The transcript reveals that Mr. Nixon, on his own initiative, discussed accommodating blackmail demands on at least a half a dozen occasions during the meeting without once suggesting that paying the men for their silence would be wrong. Instead, the transcript reveals Mr. Nixon repeatedly discussed different methods by which as much as one million dollars could be paid to the burglars without payments being traced to the White House. The purpose of such payments in the president's own words would be, here's the quote, to keep the cap on the bottle. That's the first quote. The second is to buy time. And the third is to tough it through. Right? How much money do you need, the president asked Dean, early in the March 21st conversation, according to the transcript. I would say these people are going to cost a million dollars over the next two years, Dean replied. Right? The president goes on at that March 21st meeting to consider, according to the article, and let me read from the article here, granting executive clemency to Howard Hunt. Right? Here's the president's quote. You don't do it politically until after the 74 elections. That's for sure, Mr. Nixon told Dean. When Dean suggested that it may further involve you in a way you should not be involved in this, the president replied, no, it is wrong. That's for sure. Let me also say, too, that by chance, former CIA operative Howard Hunt happened to be a good friend, believe it or not. His family happened to be friends with the family of William Buckley, who had a TV show, Firing Line. So, Hunt actually appeared on the show. Let me quote from another article. This one is from the New York Times, May 11th. 1974. In his first extensive statement outside a court or hearing room on the Watergate break-in, Mr. Hunt said, such subsequent financial support for agents involved in clandestine activities was standard operating procedure in all his espionage experience. Here's the quote from Mr. Hunt. As far as I was concerned, said Mr. Hunt, it, his request for money, was perfectly routine. Right? Perfectly routine. So, what happens at the trial of these five burglars? Is right before they're sentenced, James McCord's lawyer hand Judge Sirica, the judge presiding over the case, who, during the case, kept asking, how high up does this conspiracy go? Who were the people you were working with and not getting complete answers from any of the defendants? Right? Well, McCord, right before he is sentenced, has his lawyer deliver a letter to the judge. It's this letter that blows Watergate wide open. The letter is so eye-opening, I'm just going to read a portion of the letter, a few paragraphs here. You're going to find out the stress these guys were under. The stakes involved. This is the McCord letter handed to the judge right before the burglars were sentenced. The, rele the relevant portion for this video. There are further considerations which are not to be lightly taken. Several members of my family have expressed fear for my life. If I disclose knowledge of the facts in this matter, 
either publicly or in any government representative. Whereas I do not share their concerns to the same degree, nevertheless, I do believe that retaliatory measures will be taken against me, my family, and my friends, should I disclose such facts. Such retaliation could destroy careers, income, and reputations of persons who are innocent of any guilt whatsoever. Be that as it may, in the interests of justice, and in the interest of restoring faith in the criminal justice system, which faith has been severely damaged in this case, I will state the following to you at this time, which I hope may be of help to you in meting out justice in the case. One, there was political pressure applied to the defendants to plead guilty and remain silent. Two, perjury occurred during the trial in matters highly material to the very structure, orientation, and impact of the government's case and to the motivation and intent of the defendants. Three, others involved in the Watergate operation were not identified during the trial when they could have been by those testifying. Four, the Watergate operation was not a CIA operation. The Cubans may have been misled by others into believing that it was a CIA operation. I know for a fact that it was not. Five, some statements were unfortunately made by a witness which left the court with the impression that he was stating untruths or withholding facts of his knowledge when in fact only honest errors of memory were involved. Six, my motivations were different than those of the others involved, but were not limited to, or simply those offered in my defense during the trial. This is no fault of my attorneys, but of the circumstances under which we had to prepare my defense. This blows the case open. Sam Irvin then starts what he's doing, starts getting greater cooperation in his investigation of Watergate, right? The case explodes on TV. People understand that this case doesn't involve five guys just trying to commit a robbery of the Democratic Party headquarters at the Watergate Hotel but that this actually involves a wiretapping effort authorized by the Attorney General of the United States that involves top White House aide John Ehrlichman and his instructions to White House Counsel John Dean and to the Acting Director of the FBI. Right, Keep in mind, J. Edgar Hoover had died. Right? You have an acting director of the FBI to get rid of evidence in the safe of Howard Hunt that was located at the White House. In sum, Watergate, even now, all these years later, is simply jaw-dropping. I've just scratched the surface and this video has already taken more than 28 minutes. Any student of American history has to pour over what happened. It's an abuse of power on really a monumental scale. The President of the United States talking about the possibility of using $1 million in untraceable money to bribe witnesses, to end an investigation into a burglary that was authorized by his former Attorney General who was now the head of his committee for re-election of the President. Simply astonishing. If you have any thoughts that you want to share with the people watching this video on YouTube, I hope you do so in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.